Good evening, Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I too live in the United States, and as the panel has made perfectly clear, and I'm sure you knew before you came into this room, we in the States are living in a period of, how can I deliberately understate it, peculiar government. It's one that almost daily has targeted journalists with demagogic abuse. That is certainly uncomfortable for journalists, and while it motivates good journalism, the mistrust, the public mistrust that it feeds is bad for journalism, and that in turn is absolutely bad for society. Still, we American journalists know very well how fortunate we are. Even these days, our discomfort is nothing compared to the oppression and dangers journalists suffer in all too many countries. In 1950, the founders of IPI recognized in a world still recovering from the trauma of World War that world peace depends on understanding among peoples, that such understanding depends on good information, and that information depends on understanding among journalists. They created IPI to promote better journalism, to promote freedom of expression, and freedom of the press, if you'll forgive that term of old technology for an ideal that we all understand. An ideal, yes, but one we have to recognize is far from reality. In far too many places, there is no peace, no freedom of expression, no safety for journalists to collect information and spread it. Consider, in Syria and Iraq, at least 27 journalists have died last year and so far this year. In Mexico, 10 were killed last year, eight of them under circumstances that remain unclear, and already seven have died this year, including one gunned down as recently as Monday. Globally, IPI has reports of at least 37 journalists who have died this year so far, many of them likely in connection with their work. In particular, while all governments have authoritarianism in their DNA, for many of them, that is the dominant gene. You've heard a lot about Turkey's president and the more than 160 journalists he has behind bars. In China and Egypt, where the numbers are hard to discover, reports of journalists detained vary from 25 to more than 40 in each country. Not far behind are Ethiopia with 17 and Eritrea with 16. To help journalists who struggle in, in their struggle against government oppression and the forces of violence to keep their fight for freedom and their suffering from being forgotten, IPI established the award of World Press Freedom Hero. The award is now given in conjunction with International Media Support, a Denmark-based media development organization. This year's award, the 69th, goes to Eskinda Negar of Ethiopia. Eskinda, a, per a persistent critic of then Prime Minister Meles Zenawi, is 47 this year and has spent most of his 40s behind bars, specifically 2,073 days since he was arrested on September 14, 2011. Convicted in 2012 for belonging to what the government labeled a terrorist organization, of allegedly conspiring, planning, and inciting a terrorist act, he was sentenced to 18 years in prison. The United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention said the sentence violated international law. Eskinder's specific act was writing a column questioning the government's use of an anti-terrorism law to punish journalists and, and the scrutiny they provide of society. But that was not his first run-in with the government. Its efforts, its efforts to harass and silence him date back to the early 1990s. In 2005, 
he and his wife, also a journalist, Sir Callum Fazil, were imprisoned for two years for treason after their coverage of a crackdown on protests against a disputed election. Their son was born in prison before their release in 2007. The government closed their publishing company and banned Eskinder from practicing journalism. Eskinder's 2011 arrest was part of a new wave of detentions of journalists under the broad anti-terrorism law Ethiopia passed in 2009. Just days before, he had told the IPI that the arrest of two fellow journalists were about calculated cultivation of fear. Fear is what dictatorships ultimately rely on to survive, he said. In 2012, the Penn American Center gave him its Barbara Goldsmith Freedom to Write Award. That year, IPI and 20 other World Press Freedom Heroes called for his release. In 2013, IPI, together with the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers, Juan Ifra, sent a delegation to Ethiopia. That mission was barred from seeing Eskinder and other imprisoned journalists. The next year, Juan Ifra honored Eskinder with its Golden Pen of Freedom Award. On hearing of the award today, Eskinder's wife, said the news was bittersweet. It was, she said, absolutely heartwarming to know that all his sacrifices and valuable contributions to press freedom are not in vain. Such recognition, she said, was important in continuing to shine a spotlight on his plight on the global stage and for the tremendous impact it's having on those who aspire to follow in his footsteps. I truly hope it also expedites his release and brings an end to his suffering, she said. So do we all. IPI invited Sir Callum to accept the award on his behalf today, but she and her son now live in the United States and for lack of proper travel documents and other reasons, she was unable to come. She suggested that a friend of her husband, fellow Ethiopian journalist Mesfin Nagash, collect the award instead. Mesfin had left Ethiopia in response to the 2009 crackdown. In 2012, he was charged along with Eskinder under the anti-terrorism law. He was convict convicted in absentia and sentenced to eight years in prison. He has received Human Rights Watch's Helmut Hammett Award for his commitment to freedom of expression, and next year, the Press Freedom Prize from Reporters Without Borders branch in Sweden, where he now lives. Today, he's a program director for a human rights organization based there, Civil Rights Defender, and together with other exiled journalists, runs an online radio station, Wazima Radio, which covers all things Ethiopian in Amharic and in English. To accept the IPI IMS Award for a, courageously, a courageous imprisoned journalist, please welcome Mesfin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I start? by expressing my heartfelt appreciation to the International Press Institute for your commitment to promote independent journalism and highlight the plight of journalists, media houses, and the state of professional journalism around the world. To be honest with you, I wish Skinder himself or his wife could have been able to be here to thank you in person. Standing here to accept such an award on behalf of a fellow journalist and compatriot who was in prison undoubtedly invites a mixed feeling for me. I have tried to reconcile these feelings and reasons since I received the invitation to come here. I am still struggling with these emotions. 
At one point, I had asked myself if accepting this award on Skinder's behalf is the best thing I can do for him, his family, and my fellow journalists in prison in Ethiopia. Wouldn't it be better if the world would feel Skinder's absence on this stage in the most direct and unmistakable manner, that is, an empty chair in his honor, instead of me standing here? I asked myself a lot of times. I'm not sure of the answer. Would I be congratulated after the award? I have asked myself. Please don't. Another challenge was what and how to say on behalf of such a prolific writer as Skinder is. One reason override all my doubts to join you here today. I was talking about this event with Sir Kalam Fasil, a journalist, an editor, and Skinder's wife. Sir Kalam reminded me how important it is for a prisoner to know the world is not forgetting him or her. I imagined the feeling of being forgotten and being alone, creeping in Skinder's cell. There may not be any better place than this to fight back this feeling. We gathered this evening to celebrate the courage of imprisoned journalists such as Skinder Naga. Such international solidarity sends messages both for the victims and the, in, the perpetrators. This is one way, best way to groom, protect, and encourage young journalists, bloggers, and dissenters who dare to speak the truth. This is more important today than ever, where the tide of dictatorship seems getting momentum east and west, north and south. Iskander has never ceased writing, reflecting, and criticizing since he opened his first newspaper in 1993. I believe he knew very well the kind of risk he was taking. Subsequently, he faced the injustices all along with courage and humility, of course, at a great price for himself and his family. The Ethiopian government accused Skinder along 23 other defendants, including myself, and he was later sentenced to 18 years in jail for a concocted crime of participating in a terrorist activity. No other journalist ever sentenced for such a long time in Ethiopia. Similarly, no other case may capture the state of the press and the politicization of the fight against terrorism in Ethiopia than Skinder's ordeal. His courage made him a familiar name, a symbol of persistence for many Ethiopians. He inspired many young journalists and bloggers. Skinder symbolizes all that went wrong in Ethiopia related with the press and rule of law. In the words of Jason McClure, who was a Bloomberg correspondent in Ethiopia, it would be hard to find a better symbol of media repression in Africa than Skinder Nega. On this occasion, it will be thoughtful of us to remember what could be happening to journalists in prison beyond being locked behind bars. The blatant disregard for justice and rule of law doesn't usually stop at sentencing journalists. For example, the way Skinder is treated in prison for the last almost six years is inhuman, to say the least. It's not because Skinder is a kind of person who disturbs others, but it is intended to break his spirit. He was kept in a solitary confinement for months. For a significant part of his prison time, he was denied the right to be visited by 
friends, family members, and even religious leaders. For the last several months, only two people are allowed to pay him a visit. One of them, his mother-in-law. Majority of the prisoners in Ethiopian prisons have a limited access to books. Skinder has no access at all. Even his last bastion, the Bible, was taken from him. Despite all this, he remained spirited, not broken. Mistreatment within the prison is one way of punishing journalists. Some sent to remote prisons, others denied medical access and the like. The recognition IPI bestowed upon Skinder today, our voice of solidarity from Hamburg will reverberate in his cell tonight. Skinder knows about this award, scantily though. He knows that an organization has awarded him a prize. But the family members who are visiting him cannot communicate which organization, when, and how, and probably why. Certainly, this news will reach him in days. I believe he will be encouraged and consoled. Had Skinder been here to accept this award, he would have spent much of the time talking about other journalists in prison and exile. More importantly, he would have dedicated it to his fellow journalists across Africa and beyond. I would do the same on his behalf today. Fellow journalists suffering in the hands of dictators, warlords, drug cartels, and the like, this is a recognition for your contribution. The world never forgets you and your work. Allow me to mention only a few of the journalists in prison in Ethiopia in their honor. Ubishetaye, sentenced for 14 years. Darsa Masori, sentenced for four years. Khalid Mohammed, six years. Zalalam, work again for five years. Tamas Gandasaling, for three years. And Elias Gabru, who was detained in a police station for six months without even being questioned. I will conclude my speech by sharing with you a message from Sir Karim Fasil, Skinder's wife, who is currently living in the U.S. Dear members of the International Press Institute, please accept my profound gratitude for recognizing Skinder's sacrifice and remembering him in a world stage. He is imprisoned for the mere fact of exercising his freedom of expression. Such recognitions are important moral support for him his family, and other fellow journalists in the same situation. This is a testament to his valuable contribution and the price he is paying. It means a lot for us. Keep your work of recognizing and encouraging journalists across the world. I thank you, end of quote. And finally, I wish you a very productive and successful Congress. Thank you. There is uh, one more award coming. Good evening. I'm Andreas Sugar from International Media Support. Ladies and gentlemen, dear honored guests, we are gathered here the next two days to discuss how to build the journalism we need in this challenging time where fake news, online harassment and hate speech are spreading all, over, all around the world. According to Freedom House's Press Index, global press freedom has now declined to its lowest point in 13 years with unprecedented threats to journalists and media outlets. There is no doubt that media worldwide face enormous obstacles.
But at the same time, we see strong local movements protecting the messengers, in some cases even supported by governments committed to enhancing media safety. Tonight, we celebrate the bravery and tenacity of those media workers and organizations that, despite the dire circumstances, persevere in their mission to safeguard independent journalism and media workers. The annual Free Media Pioneer Award is recognizing news or media organizations that have made innovations and promoted news access or quality, or assisted journalists and the media community, and thereby ensured more free and more independent media in their country or region. This year's recipient, the Afghan Journalist Safety Committee, is a countrywide safety mechanism which monitors incidents and provides media professionals with advice and practical safety measures. 16 years since the inception of free media in Afghanistan, many brave souls have lost their lives. Ajmal Naqshbandi, Zabi Tamanna, David Gilkey, Ahmad Sardar, Samad Rohani, and many other journalists who were imprisoned, assaulted, tortured, and intimidated while fighting for freedom of speech. Eight years ago, Afghan Journalist Safety Committee or AGSC, was formed to protect free media and journalists in Afghanistan. AGSC has operated as a strong defender of media and journalists' rights. Since then, we have handled over 400 cases of violence against journalists. We have provided shelter for more than 150 media workers during the fall of Kunduz province to the Taliban. We have advocated for better laws and regulations for Afghan media, promoting safety of journalists and free speech. We have assisted dozens of injured journalists with medical treatment and operated as a bridge between the media and the Afghan government. And we have conducted safety and security training for more than 600 journalists in Afghanistan, a country which was ranked as the second most dangerous place for media in 2016. Today, we're honored to have been recognized with Free Media Pioneer Award by International Press Institute. At AJC, we're delighted to dedicate this award to journalists who have lost their precious lives telling Afghans and the world the story of Afghanistan. We always remember you. Founded in 2009, the AJSC has grown to have local presence all over Afghanistan and has asserted itself as the national go-to organization for journalists at risk or in distress. The stakes around its work are high. When the Taliban took over Kunduz province in 2015 and again last year, AJSC evacuated more than 160 journalists and provided shelter, medical support, and psychological counseling. In other words, they saved lives. For journalists who must flee Afghanistan or require medical treatment not available in the country, AGSC also maintains a relocation option in India, complete with job training and study possibilities. As IPI and International Media Support wrote in our joint press release announcing this year's winners, the incredibly courageous work of the Afghan Journalist Safety Committee embodies the belief that journalism can and must thrive even in the most hostile corners of the world. AJSC's defiance and determination are helping to ensure that the people of Afghanistan can realize their right to inform and be informed, and, not, and offer not only hope, but also a model for other societies wrecked by conflict. AJSC's achievements are based not only on hard work, but also rooted in the fact that it is a truly Afghan-based safety mechanism, not a donor-driven safety project. The entire organization works hard to bring together media, local government, law enforcement, as well as civil society to protect journalists and enhance media safety. The inclusive and collaborative work makes AJSC a model for media safety work globally. 
And now I have the great pleasure to invite Mr. Najib Sharifi, Director of the AJSC, to the stage to receive, on behalf of the entire organization, the 2017 IPI IMS Free Media Pioneer Award. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. It's um, a great pleasure to be here, and it's great to see uh, some familiar faces and some new faces uh, in this great gathering uh, today, which is critical to the future of journalism in the world. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear, dear honored guests, um, I'm standing here in front of you all, humble and blessed. Um, I don't want to say how big of a sentimental value the award has for me and my colleagues in Afghanistan. I would like to offer my sincere gratitude to the jury for selecting Afghan Journalists Safety Committee for the award. A few days ago, my colleagues and I gathered in Kabul to celebrate this magnificent recognition of our work. My coworkers came to our headquarters from all over Afghanistan. We chatted in high spirits, reaffirmed our commitment to protecting journalists, this time with obviously greater zeal, and chanted salute to freedom. By the way, my colleagues are sending you grateful thoughts from the turbulent mountains of Khost province in the east of Afghanistan to the dreadful streets of Kunduz province in the north. In the past two years, Kunduz has fallen to the Taliban twice. I'm sure you all know about the Taliban. And more importantly, the brutality they subjected the Afghan people and our freedoms and culture. Each time the Taliban not only destroyed media stations, but also went from house to house in search of journalists. A few days after the city was taken back from the Taliban, when they captured the, second, the city for a second time, we named one of the streets of Kunduz city the Media Street. This is the spirit we hold in defiance to tyranny. Ladies and gentlemen, Afghanistan is not an easy place to work. I'm sure you're all aware of it, but despite all difficulties, we have come a long way. Today, Afghan Afghanistan is more than just a war zone. Let me give you some perspective. It was the year 2000. I was living in Kabul. Taliban were ruling the country with their self-interpreted version of the Sharia law. I had a small convenience store next to my house. I secretly and against the Taliban's rules sold postcards illustrating female and male India film actors popular in Afghanistan, but mostly female. I'm pretty sure that the Indian colleagues know what I'm talking about. One day, the Taliban's religious police raided my shop and found the postcards. I was hiding them in a very secret place, but they still managed to find them. I guess someone that leaked the information to them. They arrested me and took me to jail. Uh, in the jail, I came across two of my high school friends. One of them was brought to jail because the Taliban found a music tape in his pocket. And the other one was arrested for shaving his beard. What a crime, you might say. Why am I telling this? 
It's because this is how our life was in 2001, during the Taliban rule, full of secrets, obviously. Listening to music and watching movies was a crime. There were only two media stations, one radio, one newspaper, that were solely used for the propaganda purposes of the government, of the regime. But today we have the most vibrant media in the region. According to RSF Freedom of Expression Index, we are ahead of India by 16 points. India, which is the world's largest democracy. Media and freedom of expression are the most significant success stories of Afghanistan in the past 15 years. And do you know what else? Today, the harshest debates take place in Afghanistan's media outlets. When political analysts become emotional, they even curse the president of the country and get away with it without repercussions. This is where we are today. We have legal freedom of speech in Afghanistan today. Unfortunately, Afghan media is also a threat to the Taliban's campaign of violence against the state and the people. This is why they changed their policy towards the media, which resulted in a dramatic escalation of violence against journalists. In 2016, 13 journalists were murdered in Afghanistan making Afghanistan the second most dangerous country for journalists after Syria. And now we also have ISIS joining Afghanistan, based ISIS, joining Taliban and attacking the media. Just yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, ISIS attacked the state-run media station in Jalalabad city in the east. And their attack led to the death of four of the staff of the station. They also disseminated a message, a post, where they called all journalists legitimate targets that deserve to be murdered. We at AJC closely monitor all threats, be it from warlords or Taliban or ISIS, and take precautionary measures against these threats. Uh, we address safety from multiple angles and have adopted a holistic approach to the issue of safety. One that works on both prevention and is able to act rapidly in response to emergencies. Our mechanism of local safety, our mechanism of lo local safety focal points covers all of Afghanistan's provinces, has inspired countries such as Pakistan, Somalia, Iraq, and Yemen, to establish lo local safety programs similar to AJAC. We work to enhance women's presence and leadership in the media sector, and we have run campaigns against sexual harassment to ensure female journalists feel safe and protected in their working environment. This is just like small parts of our work at AJAC in Afghanistan, ladies and gentlemen. So, what's been the key to our success? I will just give you three words. Passion, commitment, and cooperation. Our bitter experiences from the dark times in the past and our thirst for gaining the fundamental right to expressing our views freely shapes my and my colleagues' worldview. Our fight is not for a sector or cause. It's for the truth. It's for a vision that we have for Afghanistan. A vision of a peaceful, prosperous, and democratic country where a free media can speak truth to power and where no tyrant regime can emerge again. This 
award has further strengthened our resolve and determination to fight for the truth. At the end, I would like to thank um, all the various national and international organizations uh, that offered very generous and relentless support to AGEC. I would particularly like to uh, thank international media support, uh, which has been with us and has been supporting us from the beginning. And uh, personally, I would like to uh, thank, I don't, Susanna is still there. <laughs> I would like to thank my mentor and supporter and colleague and friend and, and you know, I, I don't think words can des describe um, the amount of support that she has provided. Ms. Susanna Inkunen from International Media Support for the relentless support that she has provided us through the, this journey in the past uh, seven years. I would like to dedicate this award to all journalists who have lost their precious lives in Afghanistan. God bless you all. God bless journalists and God bless freedom. Thank you very much. We're coming close to the end of this ceremony. Um, I would like to thank everybody who has participated, spoken, stood up, and expressed uh, support for press freedom and independent journalism. I would like to thank international media support for joining IPI in awarding some exceptional journalists. I'm so glad we ended on a positive note. Press freedom is improving in Afghanistan. And, uh, with this, I also would like to inform you that tomorrow the Congress will continue at a different venue. It is the House of the Patriotic Society. Please check your documents uh, to know where it is. It's very close to the City Hall. And um, once again, I would like to thank First Mayor Mor um, to, for, for staying with us um, at the whole evening and uh, the Senate for the reception that they are offering now. Please, thank you. <laughs>